Roger Lavelle, scientist, scholar, an instrumental policymaker who was a, just a dedicated advocate of the oceans. He's also director of Scripps. So in 1999, the Ocean Studies Board launched the Roger Lavelle Commemorative Lecture. And it's really to highlight links between ocean science and policy. And I cannot tell you how pleased and privileged the Ocean Studies Board is to have the 25th lecture here at Scripps, right? Fantastic. I want you to take a look at the, the fantastic people we've had give this lecture. You can hear me. I mean, you can really hear me. 1999 to 2003. Next slide, please. I'm not going to name everyone. There we go. Right? 2004 to 2009. Look at these names. Next. 2010, 2014. Jay Lichenko. Dave Call, all of a sudden, is in color. Noticed. <laughs> Next, please. Don Wright, by the way, who's in the audience. Let us recognize. Next, please. And of course, our very own Margaret Linen. Of course, we had a, a few interruptions, COVID, right? But now I'm, I'm very excited that we can give this lecture both in person and online. I'd like to thank our audience who's online. I believe we have over 150 people who are at least registered. Um, so this is quite a spectacular audience. So without further ado, I would like to introduce Margaret Linen, the director of the Scripps Institute of Oceanography. And again, thank you so much for hosting this. For us. Thanks, Claudia. Yeah, oh, fantastic. I first met Roger Rubel when I was the dean of the Graduate School of Oceanography at University of Rhode Island, and he had come to visit John Knaus, a former dean at URI and former administrator of NOAA father of Sea Grant and many other legacies, he took after Roger, who had been his advisor. Uh, he was one of Roger's first PhD students, but he wasn't the first PhD student, even though he started first, because after World War II, Roger became the head of geosciences at ONR, and he called up his graduate student, who hadn't finished his PhD yet, John to come to Washington to be the first physical oceanography program officer at ONR. So uh, the three of us shared a love of gin martinis and uh, that led to a lively evening full of uh, sea stories. And since we had all been deans, stories about university presidents and chancellors uh, and other outrageously funny stories. I didn't imagine at the time that I would eventually occupy Roger's office here at Scripps. Uh, he was a force who changed the face of ocean science, especially in the late 40s to early 60s, both with his own science and with his role in putting oceanography literally on the map as an important focus of international attention. Uh, when I speak about his own science, uh, most of us are familiar with his amazing paper with Hans Seuss in 1957, which examined carbon dioxide exchange between atmosphere and ocean and the question of an increase in atmospheric CO2 during past decades. Their work used carbon isotopic measurements to show that counter to the canon at the time, the ocean was not taking up all of the CO2 being admitted by fossil fuel combustion, and that it was accumulating in the atmosphere. And this is the paper where he called attention to the fact that we were conducting a large geophysical experiment, which could never be done before and would never be replicated. 
Uh, he then coerced every major opportunity for international collaboration to work on this problem for him. He served UNESCO on the International Geophysical Year, which did some of the first global measurements uh, that were related to this, the International Indian Ocean Expedition, Adams for Peace, the Special Committee on Ocean Research, SCORE. He chaired the first International Oceanographic Congress, the first U.S. National Committee for International Biological Program, amongst just a few. And here at Scripps, in addition to his own personal science, he launched a set of major long-range expeditions in the 50s, including Midpac, Pacific, Transpac, Equipac, and Norpac, each transversing a different region of the Pacific Ocean. These were the first comprehensive looks at the at the Pacific, and as was the the uh, uh, the custom during these expeditions, they did everything. They did physical oceanography, they did chemical oceanography, they did geology, geophysics, and uh, biology. The roots of many of today's efforts are buried in Roger's ideas. Project Mohole, which he developed with Harry Hess, led to today's scientific ocean drilling program. Roger hired Charles David Keeling to measure CO2 in the atmosphere to confirm uh, his conclusions with Hans Seuss, leading to the Keeling curve. As director of Scripps, he sat on, at that time, there was no university here. He sat on the Council of Chancellors of the UC system and used his position to push relentlessly for a university in San Diego as part of the UC system. He succeeded in the early 60s and would not have been surprised at the success of the university. After all, he recruited several Nobel Prize winners to the first set of faculty. He brought them out during February and March when it was always sunny, no June gloom, no May gray, uh, and when it's 65 in La Jolla. And then they were entertained at Walter Monk's home with the commanding view of the Pacific Ocean, saying, this is where assistant professors live in La Jolla, because Walter was assistant at the time. He was a man of big ideas and the good sense and global connections to bring them to fruition. Thank you, Ocean Studies Board for and the Academy for recognizing this giant in the history of our field and for giving us the opportunity to host the 25th anniversary of the Ravel Lecture. And now I have the double satisfaction of introducing one of our own alums, Dr. Kim Cobb, who earned her PhD here in oceanography in, in 2002. Dr. Cobb is a recognized climate scientist and climate communicator. Her research uses observations of the past and present to advance our understanding of the future and future climate change and climate impacts. Scripps first came into her orbit when she participated in the Scripps Undergraduate Research Fellowship Summer Program known as SURF. According to her co-advisor, Chris Charles, in the audience here, she had a fieldwork experience that was particularly upsetting, but particularly consequential. She participated in a cruise in the Central Tropical Pacific to collect fossil corals to document sea level rise associated with the melting of the last ice age glaciers. That mission went largely unmet because of the extreme difficulties at sea that November 1997, during which was which, which what during what is now recognized as the major El Nino of the 20th century. However, a real testament to the kind of uh, insight and uh, an application that is so characteristic of Kim's work. She saw the possibility of using fossil corals in a completely different way to develop a comprehensive history of El Nino Southern Oscillation Variability. 
She went on to develop this new approach for the bulk of her dissertation work, developing an extended historical perspective of, El of en Enso. She off also watched coral bleaching happening in real time at a major scale. By the end of her PhD, she had completed over 10,000 individual oxygen isotopic analyses of the corals that she collected in the central tropical Pacific. The approaches and the materials of her dissertation are still bearing fruit 20 plus years later as subsequent generations of scientists uh, and students continue to exploit the coral archive uh, for new insights into modes of ocean climate variability and their impact on coral ecosystems. It's truly amazing to think about how much she accomplished when you know that she went out there, look at, faced with the situation that this idea that she had for a thesis was not going to come to fruition. That's real initiative, and it's the kind of, of uh, stick to itiveness and uh, insight that is really characteristic of Kim's whole career. She went on to a postdoc at Caltech and then joined the faculty at Georgia Tech, where she not only continued and really cemented her reputation as a scientist, but really dug in to, cl to climate outreach and communications. Recently, she moved to Brown University, where she is the director of the Institute at Brown for Environment and Society. In 2021, she served as the lead author for the IPC's uh, sixth assessment. Just last year, the Biden administration appointed her to the president's intelligence advisory board, where she provides independent counsel on U.S. intelligence matters. She's also devoted to communication of climate change to the public through media appearances, public speaking, and social media cha channels, where she has 30,000 followers on her X account uh, at Coral and Caves. Follow her. Kim is also a mother of four, an incredibly strong advocate for women in science, who champions diversity and inclusion in all that she does. I'm really looking forward to this evening, and I know you are too. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Kim Cobb as the 25th Revell Lecturer. Great. Thank you so much, Margaret, for that introduction. And it's just amazing to be back at Scripps after 20 some years. And I can look at the audience and I can see so many faces. Y'all have not changed a bit. So that's incredible. I don't know what you have going on here. But it's also true that the layers of filth and detritus in my co-advisor's office haven't changed one bit either. So, you know, there's a time capsule effect here going on. Um, but, but really, it's amazing. It's amazing to be back and um, really just uh, incredible to be following in the footsteps of so many iconic heroes of our field um, that have given this lecture previously. It's, it's humbling, truly, truly. So um, I wanted to just dig in a little bit to I'm really eager to to talk a little bit about Roger Ravel at the top here, because I also did a little bit of homework about Roger Ravel in the run up to uh, my lecture today. And um, if, yeah, I guess somehow flipped around. Um, but I, I wanted to just call attention to the fact that some of the work that he did as quote, the, the grandfather of greenhouse uh, warming effect um, was done so in a time period when the record of instrumental temperatures were extremely scant. And so next slide. And this is one of the um, pieces that I, I dug up from a 1961 paper um, cataloging what at the time was the history of global average temperatures 
um, at a global, whatever they knew about the global temperatures is represented here. And this was not really uh, available in real time, of course, like we have it today. And there were a lot of error bars attached to it. And I, I particularly as a paleoclimate scientist, uh, love the fact that they call out the pre-1882 somewhat arbitrarily as the cutoff between what we should trust and what we should not trust. Uh, but it's a reminder of those heady times in the mid 20th century um, when they were already aware uh, that the greenhouse effect would come to uh, redefine our entire planet, uh, but yet this is the record of temperatures that they were looking at at the time. Um, next slide. Of course, he went on to many more uh, things and, and topics in science. Margaret already covered them, all of the many accolades that he has, including a National Medal of Science that he received for his work in so many different fields. But one thing that I did want to, um, to kind of call attention to in my research about Roger Revelle is despite his accolades and his um, qualifications for the position um, of director, he was really not the top choice for the position by the Scripps faculty at the time. Uh, one Scripps professor complained that Roger was too untidy to be trusted with administration, maybe not unlike my uh, former co-advisor, noting that he just let everything pile up on his desk and was too easily diverted. And Roger himself agreed with this assessment, noting, quote, have obvious and many numerous weaknesses, such as a tendency to procrastinate, to take on too many obligations, not to delegate authority, and to be high-handed, unquote. So that was his own assessment of his fit for, for the role of director here. And of course, eventually he was appointed, but over the continued objections of the Scripps faculty, who drafted their opinion to the leadership in a letter dated 1950, quote, we understand that the impression has been gained in some quarters that opposition is vanishing at Scripps Institution to Dr. Ravel as a candidate for director. We assure you that whereas we have a high regard and friendship for him, we feel as strongly as before that his appointment would not be in the interest of the institution. He was appointed that same year, needless to say. So at any rate, this, uh, as a director myself now, I, I can take particular pride and, and joy in that um, series of exchanges there. But I wanted to note here that he ended his career um, looking towards the future and towards global inequities and doing everything he could to address them in, in his position at Harvard, working to uh, an equitable prosperity and development for the global south. And I'm not going to read that quote, but I think it really uh, will come full circle in the sense that much of what I'm going to talk about today is also thinking about how we can involve our science and our institutions in service to these kinds of outcomes, recognizing that it's now clearer than ever uh, what the climate crisis um, will be unleashing in terms of uh, loss and damages to the global south in particular. So this is, a, a, in my view, such a visionary uh, position that he took and to tackle this late in his life is quite astounding. Next slide. So, you know, Roger Ravel passed away in 1991, and three years later, I came onto this campus as an undergraduate, I'm interested in global climate change very vaguely, in oceanography very vaguely, and um, was this is the record of global temperatures that uh, was at present when I stepped onto this campus, although certainly it wasn't quite as articulated as this with so many different institutes weighing in on, on all of the um, early temperature records, certainly was not this good. Um, but uh, this is something that um, at the time was very, very clear, of course, as presented in the first assessment report from the IPCC cover. Um, that Back in the day, of course, they used to hard print these and they used to be tomes like you know several inches thick. And I remember walking over to the lawn and there was a table with this tome on it. And I said, I kind of want to purchase this. It's pretty expensive though. I did muster the 15 bucks or whatever it was to, to literally purchase my first hard copy of the first assessment report and, and read it with, with uh, incredible um, surprise and shock to see the statements that were written in there about our climate future and to think uh, forward what this curve would look like in the coming decades. And so that was, you know, kind of the Ravel's ending in, in my beginning in some of this field, marked by this publication of this incredible um, heady assessment report. Next slide. And so really what, what became my career is already articulated in part by Margaret Leinen was thinking about um, the tropical Pacific Ocean and how its role in climate was evolving with continued greenhouse gases. And in particular, as was referenced, my first ever research cruise took place from Hawaii to the equator in October, 1997. 
and she made it sound, you know, like a real train wreck. It really was a complete scientific train wreck and <laughs> it's very dangerous. And there are many OSHA violations involved as well. Um, and maybe some HR ones too. Um, but one of the things that I'll always remember is being the only woman on that cruise with 27 men. So that was for two months. <laughs> so, you know, as, as much as it was a scientific train wreck and, and many other train wrecks, um, I, I really uh, learned how to navigate in an environment that at the time was um, very foreign and, and, and challenging for me as a young woman scientist. But um, we were also, unbeknownst to us, you know, sailing right into what was to become the largest El Nino event on record. So this is a depiction of its um, kind of view from space, if you will, in, uh, in, in sea level, uh, sea surface temperatures that were um, absolutely incredibly high. Over three degrees uh, anomalies at the Central Pacific sites that I would come to study for the rest of my research program. Um, next slide. And so when we were on that cruise, um, this was the record of temperatures that we were faced with. And the 1997-1998 El Nino um, would come to be the largest spike you know, off the charts, and it prompted all kinds of doomsday scenarios um, about the pace of climate change and whether we understood it very well. And now we know that every El Nino event, this is the kind of talking points that come up, including this year, about whether uh, warming accelerated um, with these step functions that take place in global average temperatures around these events. Next slide. So this really prompted at the time the discussion with some with some um, urgency around whether the El Nino Southern Oscillation as a natural climate cycle was changing in response to greenhouse gases. And so uh, this was the question that really caught my imagination as somebody who would, you know, whose career in some ways was born in the fire of the 1997 El Nino event um, on a ship with 27 men at the equator for two months. Um, it, it just was really something that I thought um, was worthy of a career of study. It turned out to maybe take several careers more than I currently have available to me to answer this question definitively. It's a tough one. Next slide. And so um, this really you know, pushed me to go into uh, the coral archive and think about what we could do to leverage uh, the coral information from the most recent decades and push it back as, as many centuries as we possibly can um, to reconstruct the comings and goings of El Ninos and La Ninas on our planet. And this is a picture of me with uh, Jordan Watson, who was also a member of the Charles Lab back in the day. And I'm, I'm pulling out a coral core that you can see there from a living coral colony at the equator. And that um, coral core is about 20 some years of information about sea surface temperatures. And so they grow about one finger width a year, give or take. And by working through the, these kinds of corals that are growing on the reef today, we could extend the record back maybe 100, 150 years if we're lucky. And then we would be turning to much older corals to extend that even further. Turns out you need many, many centuries of El Ninos and La Ninas to answer the question of whether um, its, its characteristics are changing in response to greenhouse gases. Next slide. And so this is the kind of information that, um, that we were pulling out of these records over decades of sustained work. And so this is a hell of a way to plot 20 years of my life on one plot, but, but nonetheless, here, here it is. Um, and so this, what you're looking at are many different uh, coral records pulled off the modern reefs from these Central Pacific sites that I've been working at. Um, and then you can see the satellite-based record of sea surface temperature from those sites in gray, if you look closely, because most times it's indistinguishable from the coral records. And the metric that we're using here in the coral indicator is oxygen isotopes, which um, are very sensitive to changes in sea surface temperature. They're also very sensitive to changes in sea surface composition related to the um, uh, excess rainfall that occurs during La Nina events at this region and very dry conditions conditions that occur during La Niña's at this region, cool events during this region. So th this is really um, a spectacular tool that we can use, calibrated in the modern record, extended and applied to much, much older corals to help us understand uh, the true baseline of, of this uh, natural climate cycle uh, in the recent past and then, of course, in the much more distant past. Um, next slide. 
And so these are the kinds of materials that we use to extend the record back um, many centuries and in some cases millennia. And this is sustained work over many different labs, <laughs> including the Charles Lab and others, um, to amass these long windows of information. So this is a particular 90-year-old coral that you're looking at, 90-year-long coral that grew 500 years ago. And we have done these windowing approaches back in time up to 7,000 years ago to extend our baseline of pre-industrial Nino La Nina activity. Next slide. And of course, running up to the 2015-2016 event um, was, was a, an incredible opportunity for our uh, scientific enterprise to watch an El Nino unfold um, in front of us. And we had many different expeditions um, funded over this interval to go to the research sites in the Central Pacific and look at the oceanographic characteristics of the water and the atmosphere and the coral records and their chemistry and, and all of these things. And it was at the time for the Central Pacific, it's important to note, it was the largest uh, sea surface temperature anomaly in the Central Pacific ever, even beating out the 1997-1998 event. Um, next slide. And so one of the things we're able to do on the heels of this 2015-2016 event, we tacked that one onto the end of our record, and we were actually able to see for the first time with this long baseline of pre-industrial El Ninos and La Ninas from the fossil corals, we were able to definitively say that the last 50 years are statistically significantly different than the pre-industrial baseline. So um, about 30, 25 to 30% stronger, in fact, over recent decades than the pre-industrial baseline. So I'm not going to belabor this point. There are other papers that say that that's not true. There are papers that say that is true. The IPCC says maybe. Um, and so we'll, we'll stick with that. We'll stick with the maybe. Um, but but it's for me, I, I feel like it is an answer to the question that I had been asking with respect to the witness that's available to us from the Central Pacific. I don't think that answer would change with more data, um, but, but that's not where this story ends either. Next slide. Because what happened during the 2015-2016 event was exactly what happened during the 1997-98 event, which is a huge spike in global average temperatures and a tropics-wide warming that would actually come to represent the largest loss of coral reefs on our planet in the instrument, in the record of, of such observations. So this was an event that was locally warm where it is always in the, in the Central Pacific and in Eastern Pacific, but also globally warm across the entire tropics because we've had the baseline of ocean warming um, also uh, that baked into what the corals were experiencing in the water. Next slide. And so what happened during our expeditions to the remote Central Pacific across these different, different years from 2014 to 2016 um, was a 10 month long spate of extremely high sea surface temperatures over three degrees Celsius anomalies for those of you who, who geek out on that stuff. And that was long enough um, and high enough to wipe out 90% of the corals um, that had been growing on the reef that we've been working on for, for decades at that point. So we have a, a translation from kind of a very high coral cover, very high diversity of, of different um, uh, genus and species to the right, where we have less than 5% of the corals living on that reef. And those that did survive were smaller than a fist. So we lost all the size classes. We lost most of the species on the reef. And this was a, a point in, in my career where I, I kind of had to come up, you know, short in terms of, you know, what my science was actually doing to move the needle on the issue of our day. And I will say in all honesty that I thought that this was a picture that we would be dealing with in the 2040s. 2050s. I really didn't think it was going to be 2016. And I think that probably resonates with so many of us who intellectually know what's happening with climate change, but um, we struggle to, to really internalize the headlines and the pace and the severity of things unfolding. So I think this is a shared experience, but this was um, highly personal and very devastating for me individually and, and caused me to kind of rethink a good portion of my professional trajectory and what I was spending my time on and Lots of other things, too, that I'm still actually working on that path. Next slide. So, but look at this, what, what we are facing right now is the 2023-24 El Nino, um, which has done the same thing. It has spiked global temperatures to unprecedented territory, shattering the records from previous years, which themselves were pretty 
incredible. And 2024 has an 80% likelihood of beating out 2023 as the warmest year on record, in part because it takes a very long time to cool um, oceans down from the heights that they are at right now with the current El Nino event. Next slide. And of course, we have now in 2023, the records are already, the date is in, the record has been made, and we also have um, new records emerging from across the climate landscape. Um, this is a, a sobering one talking about economic statistic. Um, NOAA compiles the index of billion dollar disasters in this country, and this was a, a record breaking year in 2023 with 28 um, billion dollar disasters across the nation, um, and a, a, some total in the hundreds of billions of dollars of hits to our economy from, from that um, spate of events. And I'm just um, remind us of the catastrophe that unfolded in Lahaina as one of those 28, but there are 27 other uh, communities and uh, facing that kind of generational loss from, uh, from devastating events across the country. Next slide. And really, this is a global phenomenon, right? This is something that's been going on for quite some time. This is a picture from Hurricane Dorian. Um, we're facing a catastrophic hurricane season again um, this summer. NOAA has projected a very high likelihood that it might be the most active season ever on record, uh, the confluence of warming ocean temperatures and favorable atmospheric conditions. And this uh, is a picture that I think just reminds us, in, in addition to the photos from Lahaina, of the, um, the injustices that are unfolding with every single one of these headlines. Um, these are uh, people that are paying with their lives, they're paying with their homes, they're paying with their livelihoods, and their, their futures have been robbed. And this is a, an incredibly impactful quote, I think, just noting the responsibility for this um, devastating losses are not borne by those people. Uh, the responsibility emissions wise, of course, are not borne by those people who have uh, been losing and will continue to lose uh, first and worst. Next slide. And so, you know, taking stock of where we are, of course, we all know in this room um, that we are flat out of time. Um, we have we have squandered precious decades. I hate, I can't believe we have to say those words. We have squandered precious decades now in meeting this moment. But now we understand with a much more clear-eyed vision around what is at stake right now and what we have, um, what, how we cannot afford to squander decades and we can't even afford to squander years and we probably can't even afford to squander months at this point in thinking about um, how we're going to rise uh, to meet this moment. So um, that's really what I came to from the 2016 um, devastations that, that I experienced uh, on the tropical Pacific reefs. And that's what has led me to think more holistically about uh, my career and how I might use my position um, within higher education to try to affect the fastest possible change um, in structural innovation that we can. Next slide. So what we're doing is we're kind of reaching for these climate solutions landscapes. And I would say that it would be great if they have these following characteristics. I would be great if they're scalable, replicable, durable, effective. That means they're based on evidence as best evidence as we can get our hands on and that they are equitable. And I'm going to really stress that last one in bold face there, because I think that we've seen both at the national scale and at the international scale that a focus on equity and justice is beginning to be a prerequisite for durable, applicable, scalable climate solution spaces. And so that's really my big bet um, in terms of my own profession and the work that we're trying to advance at Brown and thinking about how that can be a foundation for the climate solutions landscape, if you will. And so that's what I'm going to be talking about for the rest of this talk. How can we materialize some of this potential? What does it mean um, from an individual perspective as a researcher? What does it mean from an institutional perspective and a, even a cultural perspective within science? Next slide. And I want to just call attention to this amazing chapter that's new in the fifth national climate assessment that's focused on social systems and justice. So if you're interested in this space and you want to learn from the experts, that is not me in this space. I am just a physical climate scientist. I really refer you to this. And they talk about uh, a definition of climate justice, which I, I love is articulated here. Um, but they note that 
climate justice, dot, 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 is possible with medium confidence. <laughs> it's really not terribly heartening, okay? In the language of assessment reports, uh, that means, you know, you have a 50-50 chance of getting that done. Um, but I'm here to tell you that I think if we work together as a scientific enterprise, we actually can bring that future to life. And that that, again, is a, an incredibly important goal, a foundation for um, our impact and our legacy of the work that we're doing. Next slide. Okay, so I'm going to walk through what I think are some wedges of this chart, this pie chart that I'm going to show you, some components of the puzzle of how we might get there. And I want to just reference the work of Adam Sobel. He published a paper in 2021, which was kind of like rambling a little bit. It wasn't your average Adam Sobel paper. If you read his papers, they tend to be very dense and full of derivatives and gradients. Um, but this was something that, that pondered a space for science that uh, would be usable. In his frame, this would be adaptation science. We can also think about mitigation science as um, infinitely usable in this moment of meeting the crisis. And so he articulates a vision for solutions inspired research. So let's put a check on that and see how that might materialize. I'll give you some examples from my own work. Next slide. And then I wanted to call attention to Gavin Schmidt, who's been advocating for increased public engagement by climate scientists for decades now. Um, but he wrote a, a fairly convincing piece on this in 2015, um, noting that this is you know, part of our job. And this is something that is not easy. It's not incentivized well. In fact, it's quite disincentivized. Um, but it's important that we think about getting this right because this is how we can move needles in this issue as well. Next slide. And we have to consider the framing of justice. And we have to challenge the structural and historical inequities that are baking these uh, disproportionate losses into the climate crisis. And this is um, incredible work by Farhana Sultana um, in her work on water in thinking about frames that social scientists can bring to this question of how to address structural inequities with our research. So that, that should be a part of what we're driving towards. Next slide. And of course, we have to work on institutional change. So if we're thinking about addressing uh, justice and equity as a foundational component to climate solutions work, well, we need to have other folks at the table who can bring their insights, their perspectives, their lived experiences to bear on what it means to, to be successful in this work. And I'll, I'll just you know quickly mention that um, the, the teams that I'm going to talk about are, are incredibly diverse and they include academics and non-academics. So diverse in all ways really is what we're going to be striving for. Um, but this is a paper reminding us of the uh, just systemic inequities and access to a geoscience training um, that's put forward in, in 2018 by um, uh, Bernard and Cooper Tech. Next slide. And while we're at it, let's not forget our roles as leaders in decarbonization itself. So um, we are have a, uh, I know UC has incredible mandates and made progress in this space, um, but this is just a, in higher education alone, we do not have uh, a really robust way to invite engagement in climate action goals. And um, when we do have those goals, um, they are not complete in terms of articulating the opportunity spaces and the moral mandate that, that we should have to address this subject. Next slide. And so this might be like kind of putting it all together, like a, a pie chart of a holistic framework for climate action. This is how I try to drive my own work forward. And I also try to um, think about this as, as a director of a, of a um, program, an interdisciplinary program at Brown. So we have uh, up in the upper right, like a basic research and policy relevant research, which is where most of Scripps folks sit, I believe, right? And that's where I grew up as a scientist. And then we can move down to these other pieces that I've been talking about as pieces of the puzzle that may not be fully well uh, formed in your own portfolio as somebody who's interested in the space um, or institutionally as those centers where this work can either be enabled or not. And this is where um, I think long and hard about what are we, what, where are we aiming for um, individually? What are we aiming for institutionally? And these pieces of the puzzle are not just check boxes. They're pieces of the puzzle that if done properly would cut across our research programs, would inform our educational and our training programs, 
would inform the policies that we are using to incentivize or disincentivize this pie. Most, most of this is actively disincentivized, unfortunately, except for basic research and policy relevant research. And then the partnership landscape, being purposeful and mindful about the partnerships that are enabling us to take these pieces and, and bring them to life is critically important because many of these cannot be done in isolation uh, in academia. Next slide. So this is just a little bit of a smattering of my own walk through this. I'm not going to belabor this because I, I really uh, want to get to your questions and comments as well. But in 2016, on the heels of this massive El Nino event, I kind of took a wholesale pivot into the unknown. I felt like leaping off a cliff. So I just stood up at this AGU rally in December 2016 and, and said some things completely impromptu. I've never watched that video, but some of it was OK, I guess. I don't know. I certainly got myself reinvited to a lot of other troublemakers events since then, which I suppose is a badge of honor or something at this point. Um, but at any rate, I uh, started thinking about what it means to move these needles personally as well as professionally, individually, and structurally and collectively as well. So those are the spaces I've been leaning into and experimenting with on this path um, towards a more holistic framework for climate action. Next slide. And so research-wise, I wanted to highlight some of the work that um, really brought some of this to life and has informed my approach to thinking about the individual and professional opportunities um, in the research arena. And I'm not going to go into these projects, but I'm going to talk about two of them. These are all projects that are based down in Georgia, um, where I was for 18 years as a, as a faculty. Next slide. So um, these are all examples of transdisciplinary research frameworks. So transdisciplinary research is something that I'd never heard about until like, you know, I started leading these big teams of projects. So how many of you have heard about transdisciplinary research? Maybe you're just better than me. Okay, <laughs> so maybe half. Okay, that's pretty good. Some of my academic audience, not a hand goes up. Um, but this is important. This is an important concept. So we've all heard of interdisciplinary. All institutions say they're interdisciplinary right now, which they probably are. Um, I know Scripps is. Um, but are all, in, all, are all institutions transdisciplinary? Transdisciplinary means that you are working with non-academic partners as critical and core parts of your research team. So that means that you are sourcing your research questions from outside of academia, and you are defining your methods and your data from outside academia. You are co-developing solution sets and you're defining your solutions uh, by standards that are outside of academic standards for outputs. So way beyond peer reviewed publications and, and federal grants. And so I had to dig into this literature because I've never heard about it before. If you're interested, I encourage you to read on the history of transdisciplinary research. But this is solutions focused research that is aiming for impact, real world impact right now. And very often it involves um, uh, partnering with community organizations and public policymakers um, to um, uh, intervene in these uh, cycles of climate injustices. Next slide. So this is one such project that I was honored to lead and develop over, over the last eight years or so uh, down in Savannah, Georgia, where there are uh, communities that are reeling from uh, floods. Some of the largest ones, Hurricane Irma, Hurricane Matthew, um, impacted these communities in 2015, 2016, giving rise to uh, this project, which is focused on, uh, extrinsically focused on a, a sea level sensor that you can see. This is an optical sensor that you tack to docks and you report back on, uh, on sea levels in real time to emergency planners and responders. Uh, but it's also just an enabling framework as well to get some conversations going, which are pretty toxic uh, down in uh, rural Georgia. And so it has been a, a focal point for resilience planning um, and long-term decision support. We have been uh, lifting up a huge amount of K through 12 programming, which has been very successful. That's a high schooler assembling a sensor in her engineering program. And I want to call out the um, environmental justice organization who we've been working with for five years, the Harambe House, uh, which brings a strong focus on underserved communities as the primary partners in our transdisciplinary research. So um, asking questions and driving solutions that are uh, extrinsically um, uh, intrinsic to the academic process, but intrinsic to this very diverse team. The next slide. The other one I wanted to talk about briefly is uh, called the uh, Urban He ATL, and this uh, launched in partnership over the pandemic with Dr. Nataki Osborne Jelks, my colleague down at Spelman College. And this is recognizing that in Atlanta right now, every summer, um, hundreds of people 
are falling prey to uh, extreme heat. And so whether they are uh, unable to work, whether they are permanently handicapped or debilitated, or whether they die, which is also happening every single summer in Atlanta, um, across the nation, extreme heat is the leading cause of weather-related deaths in the United States. So um, that's really uh, something that is, is a current issue for, of course, many Southern cities that are reeling from these heat extremes this last week. Next slide. And so this is a project that's a little bit different. This is based on the community science framework with, again, a, a sensor at the middle of the uh, research. And this is a handheld sensor. It talks to your smartphone and enables community scientists to map urban heating across their neighborhoods. So they kind of get to drive their own questions like, what does this parking lot, how hot is this parking lot, or how how does this forest? And what about this creek? What about in the morning? What about in the late afternoon? What about inside my house? Um, all kinds of questions that they get to ask. And this is a pandemic a birth project. So it was very great to be able to mail these sensors out to people with some instructions and onboarding videos and to start getting data back in the middle of the pandemic. And people were really excited. We have all these students engaged uh, from Georgia Tech as well as Spelman College, over a hundred different students and uh, several dozen community scientists who were partnering with the um, uh, environmental justice organization that we were working with, um, West, well, West, West Atlanta Watershed Alliance. Next slide. And this is one of the maps that we got back in our first six months or so. And this is people just biking and walking across Atlanta. It's really cool. It contains all kinds of data in here, um, data from um, people that are out in the early morning and the late day all over. And then there's a lot of people walking into air conditioned buildings, <laughs> we find out. So this is like a big kind of machine learning uh, challenge that we're working through right now in terms of data analysis. And it's really fun. We've partnered with the city of Atlanta and the county emergency management agency, um, as well as many different environmental justice organizations who've been talking about extreme heat for years and years and years in Atlanta. Uh, but this kind of claims making data driven process has built a, a new level of energy into the discussion. Next slide. And I wanted to just spend a minute noting that there are ways to anchor this work within academia and lift up the work of Aradna Tripathi at UCLA, um, where she runs the Center for Diverse Leadership. And she's really in, found ways to integrate her uh, perspectives on uh, justice, equity, diversity, inclusion into her core research. So she has a diversity of water project funded by NSF. I just think that's really cool. So hats off to Aradna for finding a way to make that happen within the confines of her academic landscape. Next slide. Also at UC Irvine, um, Kathleen Johnson, one of my close colleagues in paleoclimate, um, a, um, uh, a Native American scientist herself, has spent a good portion of her efforts at UC Irvine advancing um, access for Native American students um, into the geosciences. She runs a summer camp there. It's, it's incredible. She has funded projects in this space. Again, somebody who has focused a good portion of her career around moving this needle at the intersection of indigenous um, rights and, and stewardship and learning environments in climate science. Next slide. And then I just wanted to put up the faces of some of my heroes as well, who have been pushing the boundaries of uh, climate policy and climate science um, from outside the academic environment in these cases. And so uh, Tashiana Osborne, of course, is a Scripps graduate who you all know and love very well. Uh, she's out there just absolutely smashing it at the USAID Africa Bureau. Um, happy to have her as part of my network. Um, Gretchen Goldman, who has a PhD in atmospheric chemistry, uh, has been working in the White House as the Climate Change Research and Technology Director for the Department of Transportation. Uh, Kira Lawrence and, and Lori Zielkowski are also paleoclimate colleagues of mine who have been calling me up at intervals and saying, this is all very scary. I'm about to leave my job. And I said, oh, I hope it's going to be OK. So they basically left their jobs and uh, have left into the unknown, into the policy landscape. Uh, one at the state level and one at the uh, National Science Foundation um, and are really working to advance community engaged frameworks for clean energy policies. It, their work is amazing. So I wanted to give a shout out to those amazing ladies. Next slide. So at Brown, I just wanted to quickly end by um, calling into the room our mission. So this is our new strategic plan for the Institute at Brown for Environment and Society. And you'll see solutions in there several times. <laughs> That's we have a very solutions focused mission um, infusing our research and education programming. Next slide. And the anchor program for uh, what we're trying to do is this new research initiative called Equitable Climate Futures, which was just green lighted by the president and the provost last year. 
Um, and it's a three-year initiative that the Institute uh, will be leading with four other anchor partners, Engineering, School of Public Health, and our Policy Institute, uh, focused on four pillars of strength that we feel Brown can have um, outsized impact in. So I won't belabor these, but this is purposefully and um, uh, really critically transdisciplinary nature. So anything that goes on under this umbrella will have to be done with non-academic partners um, who are uh, defining our problems and defining our outputs and solutions. So I'm, I'm really excited to get going on that. You'll see a special shout out to climate communication on this list as well, as we think about tapping the humanities um, at Brown for progress on these issues. Next slide. Okay, so just wrapping up here, this kind of coming back to the 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 pie, if the pie of climate, holistic climate action, if you will, and thinking about um, individually how this might um, inspire you, or your pie would look very different, perhaps, than of course mine. These are these are not up to scale, of course, with proportional effort here. Um, but you know, what what could your uh, climate action pie look like if you were thinking about what pieces you would want to add or subtract and what weights? Next slide. And of course, we can think about this institutionally as well. How is your institution enabling this work across this pie chart and other pie, uh, pie pieces that other people might add into here as well? Um, we are very good at basic research and poly policy relevant research. We are not so good at these other pieces and they are critical components that I've argued of a holistic approach to, to climate action. Uh, moving as, as far and as fast as we can go will require engagement in these other pieces at the very least. Next slide. And then, of course, we have to recognize that it's, you know, all of these pie charts is all very good. This takes a huge amount of time. And the engaging with this, whether individually or um, structurally as an institution, really scales with, pri with the privilege that you have. So an institution like Scripps could probably have a huge outsized impact in this space, um, thinking about what kinds of policies and practices could be enacted to further enable this work. And as well as individuals um, who, hold, uh, who hold tenure and more senior scientists will have an outsized role and impact in thinking about laying a landscape uh, to, for uh, rapid innovation in the space. Next slide. I love this. This is the moment. This is the moment that we were born for. Um, this is our charge. Uh, climate is changing and it's changing fast. And I'm here to suggest that we should change fast too. <laughs> and it can be done. The faster we change, uh, the faster we will uh, see uh, the climate changing in the right direction. Next slide. I wanted to give a, a moment of thanks to the just generations of, of young early career scientists who have been instrumental in our lab's work over decades. So I'm not going to name them all, but they are incredible as well as the visiting scholars and, and many, many collaborators who've made this work possible. Next slide. I also want to give a shout out to the amazing teams of field guides at my very remote research sites that have literally saved my lives on so many occasions that I would be here all day talking about those. But one in particular, our head field guide uh, for the uh, Christmas Island site, Zito Tiabe, who uh, passed away at sea um, in 2020 after literally having saved my life on at least five different occasions. So I want to give a, a shout out to he, him and his family. Next slide. And last but not least, to Scripps. Thanks to Scripps so much for your uh, patience with me as an uppity graduate student back in the day. Uh, this was kind of a, my best rendition, I think, uh, scouring the web for the view from my office in the third floor of Sphere du Paul after they tore down the old Ritter Hall. I had a seaside view causing all the faculty to come by my office and say, when are you leaving, by the way? <laughs> say, never, never. So I just wanted to say it's been an honor and a privilege to be a part of this community for uh, several, multiple decades now, and it's an honor to be back, and I can't wait to see what Scripps does in the coming years and decades. Thanks so much. Questions? Questions, comments, points of resonance, or no points of resonance, points of anti-resonance. I'm here for it. Mike. Yeah. 
I know there's a great reception waiting, so I will not take offense if we if we do this quickly. Yeah, so I was a lot of what you talked about in terms of action was thinking about uh, adaptation questions with respect to communities, at least the projects that I saw. Yeah. Have you seen that that kind of um, uh, engagement with people also uh, turns uh, moves the needle on the mitigation side because the only way we're really going to solve this is to mitigate the emissions. And of right. course, people need to get behind that idea. Right. Yeah. So I think I'll say a couple words there. Um, I cut the slide that that had an example from uh, the mitigation space in the interest of time. But one of the projects that we are really happy to have at the Institute at Brown is a project called Breathe Providence. And this follows in the footsteps of many other similar projects. It's based on a um, distributed network of very low cost air quality sensors. And these are um, you know, put in place, guided by community priorities and needs um, and questions. And so there are 65 such sensors across Providence right now, and they are partnering with the city and the state. And they're even now beginning to work with the EPA and thinking about how to drive emissions reduction, pollution reduction policies, which are of course emissions reduction policies across the city, across the state, and how such programs might be scaled at the national level. So that's an example of something that is very um, kind of hyper-local in nature, but because it's cropping up in so many different places in slightly different forms, um, I think that these kinds of projects have, have immense opportunity to move the needle. So that's one kind of example that mirrors much of the frameworks that I was talking about on the adaptation side. Um, but obviously, I'll also refer to the um, report on um, carbon dioxide removal that was released by the National Academies, which really notes the need for uh, community level engagement, buy-in, policy development, governance, data stewardship, when we think about how we move forward with a bold, large-scale agenda for carbon dioxide removal. So that's leaning on work that other people have done, but noting that that's something that is much harder to find. So I will say that more as a critique, perhaps, and in highlighting an opportunity space for the development of some of the technology-based solutions on the mitigation side, much of which would involve science that's conducted here at, at Scripps, um, but to think about um, what are the enabling features of a approach that is purposely transdisciplinary in nature and how could uh, community engagement frameworks really help us accelerate some of that work and recognize some of the pitfalls and opportunities that we as scientists uh, are typically blind to? That's a great question. So I have a related question about scale. Um, so this initiative at Brown, uh, the, inter the, the sort of cross-department three-year initiative is, is um, fantastic. It reminds me of a couple of other similar initiatives. There's one at Stanford at the Dora School of the Environment uh, with Arun Majumdar uh, as dean. And the other one is an initiative championed by President Sally Kornblith at MIT, known as the Climate Project. And in both these cases, you know, the, these folks talk about the need for speed and scale mm -hmm. and how um, research is very important, but the impact of the research is, is just as much or even more so. So just like your thoughts on how to achieve this, this type of scale. Mm -hmm. um, you've talked about bringing in the, the whole of community, but um, just specifically regarding the technological solutions, right? We can develop solutions in the lab and maybe do a pilot, but how do we create impact? I mean, yeah, so that's a lot. Um, you know, I, I guess, I guess what I'm trying, what I, what I laid the, the kind of the premise that I started with, I'll, I'll come back to, which is to say that, um, you know, technologies, of course, don't exist in a bubble. They exist in an economic reality, a social reality, a political reality, and typically a geographic reality as well in many cases. And so um, when we think about them that way, we have to think about laying proper foundation for their success in scaling. And I guess that's the piece that it's easy to critique from the outside. I'm not a technologist and a startup venture person, but um, I will say that you know, we have seen uh, projects uh, trip up on these kinds of aspects before repeatedly. And it's a it's a cautionary tale as we lurch forward with the tens of billions of dollars of capital pouring into a climate tech venture right now. Um, and and these these are the kinds of spaces where we need to be 
the, the academic community could be playing a really important role in engaging in, in developing of frameworks that could enable those kinds of technologies to land on more fertile ground than um, more hostile ground and polarized ground. So that's, I guess, you know, part of what um, our work is is focused on at Brown is thinking about. Um, there's a new initiative for sustainable energy at Brown, which is very similar to many of these other technology-based initiatives that we find in institutions of higher education. And um, we're growing up with them, so to speak, in leaning into this new climate solution space and thinking about, you know, what does it look like to think about, um, you know, piloting uh, smart grids that are community-informed and community-based that, that might provide um, templates and frameworks that could be replicated and scaled. So again, if we focus on replicability, scalability, um, we're going to quickly see that that equity and justice piece is going to be an enabling instrument for, for durability and, and feasibility. And right now I'm, I'm worried that it is being uh, undervalued in the run up to some of these enterprises. Any other questions? Hi, Kim. Um, I'm curious about your, you know, being, I guess, an insider now in the White House <laughs> or in that space. That's saying, it's saying a lot. <laughs> I mean, they lock me in a room every month for several days. Yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, from from within that context, what are some of the things that we can be uh, heartened by or excited by or inspired by? I mean, what do you see there that's changing? Oh my goodness. I mean, I wish I were privy to all of that. Um, uh, what I am privy to, I can't even talk about. So that's especially frustrating uh, with your question. Um, but I, I will say that um, this administration's approach to the climate solutions landscape is, um, is humbling in scale and scope and reach. When you get up close to it, um, that's what you see and that's what you feel. So um, my presence on this intelligence advisory board is the only scientist and, and a climate, the first ever climate scientist is not an accident, right? So you have to think about how that is replicated um, across the entire government. And there's, you know, questions that emerge around durability of this enterprise um, with, the, with the political landscape that we face right now. Um, but I, I can tell you that that's, that's the, the best news. And that's the evidence of that is really the Inflation Reduction Act um, and the, um, the the Chips and Infrastructure Act. So those are that's evidence of how um, bold and how effective um, this administration is on climate. So that's one thing I, I will share somebody who's down there a lot and, and is able to work with those folks. Of an age, I can't see anything. Um, so, Kim, you've really been an inspiration, I think, to a, a lot of scientists who really want to think about how to to communicate and talk to the public and and think about giving back to communities. And so, I'd love to hear maybe a couple points of advice that you might give to all of those early career scientists who are who are looking at you and they're like oh i can do it and and given all the stressors and pressures right within the academia specifically mm -hmm. if if you could talk a little bit to that uh, about some strategies and about how you've navigated some of those let's say competing interests yeah um, in the work that you're doing yeah i mean i think the first thing to recognize is there's kind of a time and a place for everything and um, it kind of goes back to my responsibility scaling with privilege comment. So kind of, you know, uh, putting a finer point on that, um, you know, it was really at the time of tenure that I started to think about, uh, you know, how much fun it might be to lean into the communication space. Um, and when I did so, I received a huge amount of pushback from my closest community and some very close colleagues were like, 
now you're a partisan hack. Now you're being political. We're not political. We're objective. And now you're trying to jump ahead. It's it's publications that get you ahead. And it's not all this flash, all of these things. So speaking to, to your comments about the barriers. So, um, you know, with with tenure, of course, I, I felt more entitled to lean into those um, opportunities. But I do think, and I think this is important to the early career folks out there, that the landscape is changing. It hasn't changed the extent that we need it to. And I think institutions like Scripps could go a lot further in thinking about facilitating this work and incentivizing it properly and rewarding it properly. Um, but it is changing. So you know, when you sit on a hiring committee now, um, you're not going to find people being penalized for that work. Um, you are going to find them uh, being lifted up for their engagement in that space. And I, I've seen that again and again. So that's that's a heartening note. Um, and I'll also say that there are now more opportunities than ever to, um, uh, I guess, explore a diverse set of spaces in the communication landscape. So um, you can, it's not just Twitter anymore. <laughs> there are, you know, podcasts and, and newspaper op-eds. There are whole conventions around science communication that you can get involved in. Um, so it's it's a large and very growing community. And there's a um, a large network of folks who who stick together and lift each other up. That wasn't the case when I got into this business um, in the early 2010s. So that's another kind of enabling and supportive instrument that you can find. Like the second you dip a toe into this landscape, you'll you'll find that community. And, and it is a source of, of sustenance on the day to day, but also um, growing and much more powerful every day network of folks who care about this and are investing in it. So that's the that's the the bright parts, I think. But I will also say it's just been um, probably you know the most rewarding professional activity that I have done is to um, explore this space and, and tackle new skill sets and learn new things um, and challenge myself. Certainly live TV is ne never something I ever want to sign up for. I, I never like that, <laughs> but everything else, you know, I, I love it. And um, it's something that really helps me connect the science that I do with what's important to people today. And now stand here and say that um, much of what I've pivoted my research into is actually all it is, is about listening to what people care about in the climate space. And just, that's it. That's like the secret sauce. So if you want to do this work, you know, listen, listen to what people care about it, you know, public talks and the questions you get. And you think, I didn't really have a good answer to that. Well, may maybe you could. And there are a lot of knowledge gaps to fill that the public actually has their finger on if we just listen carefully. So that's a great way to infuse the work that we're doing. Well, for the online folks, I think you need the mic. Hi, what kind of advice can you give community uh, members uh, in terms of how to approach academics to start uh, projects? Mm -hmm. uh, in, in the past, you know, I've, I mean, you have to come with a certain amount of money in order to hire grad students. <laughs> well, money always helps now. Just you know, and so is there any, what's the entry point, you know, going the other way? From community to academics. Yeah, I mean, I think um, so. I'll tell you how I got involved and in, how these projects got started. Um, you know that I was involved with, especially the Savannah, Georgia one. Um, there was a, and this is something that I think um, we're trying to replicate at Brown in a way in a slightly different fashion. But there was a call. <laughs> The, the academics in them are going to laugh, like roll over out of your chairs. There was a call that Georgia Tech made for uh, $50,000 grants that they were going to compete. Half of the funding had to go to a community partner and half of it would come to us. $25,000. Okay. Yeah. So, you know, we were like, I don't put my pen to a paper for less than half a million. Right. Um, but, but, but yet, you know, this was, this was um, very, very competitive. It turned out that over 27 teams um, competed for these six very microscopic awards. Um, and uh, we were one of them. And so the day the call dropped, um, you know, I had I had a, been talking about sea level rise with one of my colleagues in computer science. 
And I called him and I said, this is, this is our moment. This is it. And he said, I don't think this is it. This is really small money. I'm like, this is it. <laughs> and so um, I literally like cold called, you know, a, a, a emergency planner in, in Chatham County, Georgia. I said, you've never heard of my name, but uh, my name is Kim Cobb. And there's this $25,000 that we want to get you. And he was like, that doesn't sound like a lot of money. I'm like, I know, but this is it. This is it. And so we were one of the six um, programs to be selected. And it was just enough for us and just enough for the community. And, and $8 million later, um, that project um, has a durability of about 10 years now and a funding stream for 10 years with core staff on this coast and everything. So um, that's, that's one way. I think that's a way that institutions can be enabling with very small money to provide some on-ramps for faculty that really want to do this work and community partners that are ready to do it. They don't even need oftentimes a 25K, although it, it helped in that case. Um, in the Urban Heat Atlanta example, that's a completely different thing because the academics came up with that idea and then um, we're trying to find a community partner and you don't have to go far because there are organizations who've been working these issues for decades in our backyards especially when we think about the environmental justice related um, challenges within communities. Um, these are storylines that date back decades. And that's the humbling experience as an academic of saying, I have a great gizmo. It's going to measure urban heating. It's going to be super great. You're going to love it. And they're like, yeah, welcome to the club. We've been working with the mayor's office for 30 years. And here's the 45 people who've been working this issue right this year. And so um, that was that was how that came to be. And that required us to take a back seat and listen and learn for, for two years while we amassed our data. And, and we tried to have our data products and, and claims making work through those community organizations. Um, but, you know, I think there are other ways to do it that are community led as well in terms of communities that are able to articulate what some of their acute needs are and how um, scientists can begin to fill those gaps. Um, I don't think that many scientists appreciate um, the level to which um, we have knowledge gaps when it comes to solutions making in the climate space. And I certainly came, you know, square up against that with the projects I was working on in sea level rise and in urban heating. Um, and community members oftentimes know those knowledge gaps. They actually do know better than us anyway. And so. Um, Again, by, by kind of thinking about surfacing some of those from the community perspective and, and reaching out to an academic institution, I think might be a way forward. I've never seen it work that way in my own experience, but um, I'm, I'm now um, started, I'm on, on the advisory council for Resilient Barrington, which is like my tiny little town of Rhode Island. And we're working from a community-led perspective to surface some of these issues. And it's happening more and more. And I think that scientists are always looking for those opportunities to get involved. Thank you. That might be it. Are there is there an online pressing online question that needs? Do we need to? Uh, there are a few. Can you hear me? There yeah. are a few online questions. I don't know. We're past time. Um, yeah. I'm happy no? to call okay. it. If you guys want? All right. So here's here's a long one. Um, when you work with communities to define needs and priorities, but are working with time or project limited funding. How do you balance meeting their needs with the realities that it may be impossible to answer their questions fully or sustain research with the funding in hand? Um, essentially, how do you not overpromise while also honestly engaging and trying to meet needs as much as possible? Yeah, I mean, that's a tough one, especially on these blended teams where you have graduate students working to uh, towards publications that they need for a dissertation and they're biting off a problem which may be somewhat removed from community priorities is in my experience at any rate, yet it's maybe foundational and enabling for the work. Um, I think one of the things that we didn't start with when I started this work, but that we started with in the sea level sensor project, we started with it with the urban heating framework is a um, an MOU of sorts to outline expectations and guidelines for how funding will be sought and distributed um, over the course of the engagement, over the course of the project. There's also within that framework, a kind of um, commitment to a sustained engagement that is in itself 
um, something that is not to be taken for granted and historically had not been in place for so many of these academic community partnerships. It's going to hear one day, gone the next. And so that MOU articulates um, issues like data governance and stewardship and access, um, funding, uh, how it's going to be raised and by whom and for whom, um, you know, the community engagement frameworks, the cadence, the mechanisms, the feedback loops, um, any infrastructure needs or equipment needs or things like that. So it, it really stepped through all of these different categories and it enabled us to, um, I think, move forward with a shared understanding, um, a modest foundation of, of mutual trust um, that was uh, important for both cases. So we didn't start with that with, with the sea level sensor project and boy, did it end up biting us very, very badly working with underserved communities. And it took a lot, it took years to uh, build a, a foundation for um, a, diff a better partnership that uh, one that we, we had not been appreciated above from the outset. So that's what I would say is you can go into these projects with um, these MOUs in place and there are now uh, entities at the national level that provide templates for such things. You, there, I would point people to the FAIR uh, framework um, where people could borrow and tweak these um, equitable frameworks for conducting co-developed research and, and tweak them as they need for their own purposes. But you don't have to start from scratch and please don't start from scratch because the uh, possibility that you will reenact structural harm is very high <laughs> when you come in with the blinders that academics have. So uh, lean on the uh, work that's been done out there. And um, I think there's a high chance that you could avoid those outcomes and, and optimize for uh, everybody's benefit as you go. But thank you for that. That's a great question. I have a, an easier one here, maybe. <laughs> okay, one one, um, one more easy one, one then. More. Okay, so when you say 30% increase in strength, um, what is the variable or index used as a measure of strength? Yeah, so we basically just look at the standard deviation of the interannual band. So uh, that means that on average, stronger ones are occurring more frequently. That's what we would say. Um, we, we have looked at other kinds of metrics. Um, that's a very simple one to apply and relatively simple one to interpret. It doesn't mean that, you know, the, the entire underlying phenomenon is, is juicing up, however, because it's only one site in the middle of the central Pacific ocean. And it's a proxy that can be uh, contributed to by various physical drivers. And so, um, you know, we shouldn't be too glib in saying that, oh, it's it's a it's a wholesale increase. Um, it's an increase in variability at that site, which indicates either a an increase in the temperature related component of of the phenomenon in the central Pacific um, and or an increase in the atmospheric response to um, underlying sea surface temperature anomalies related to El Ninos. That really wasn't as simple as you might have thought it was. So <laughs> we'll leave it there. <laughs> All right, with that, I guess I'll thank everybody for coming out. Thank you so much.